Hello and welcome to the World Bank Group IMF 2021 Spring Meetings and today one of our four days of public programming. I'm Paul Blake and in a few minutes we'll kick off today's session on economic recovery and how we can build a green, resilient and inclusive future. But first, let's take a moment to understand what to expect over the course of the week and how you can get involved. The World Bank Group IMF meetings are virtual once more. And while our buildings are relatively empty when compared to past years, you connecting wherever you are have more opportunity than ever to take part. For weeks, we've been convening and recording in-depth conversations with some of the world's leading experts on the most urgent development issues of our time. Now for these spring meetings, we're proud to bring you four events that will play out over four days and cover four important themes, economic recovery, debt, climate, and vaccines. And while the main events are recorded, our subject matter experts are standing by live online right now to answer your questions and share your comments. Hi, I'm Nejma Sheh. As each event plays, my colleagues and I will be answering your questions in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic in the live chat at live.worldbank.org. And while you're here, please vote in our poll. There will be a new question every day. And after each event, we'll be back here live from our headquarters in Washington, DC. And on this socially distant set, we'll be putting some of the most popular questions that have come in online to senior World Bank Group leaders and experts. So what are you waiting for? Find all the details and share your perspective, live.worldbank.org. And if you're following the conversation on social media, use hashtag inclusive future to have your voice heard. Now I'll be back here in a little over an hour for a live discussion with the International Finance Corporation's Moxar Diop and the World Bank's Manuela Ferro and much more. So please do stick around to join me for that. But now let's launch into it. Today's main event, economic recovery toward a green, resilient and inclusive future hosted by journalist Larry Madowo. <laughs> Welcome to everyone in our virtual audience around the world. We're so glad you could join us for the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meetings and for this kickoff event on economic recovery toward a green, resilient and inclusive future. I'm Larry Midowo and I'll be your host for the next hour. The pandemic has dealt the global economy an unprecedented shock and the recovery is likely to be slow and uneven. Disadvantages and inequalities have been amplified with harm falling hardest on poorer people, businesses, and countries. Today, we're going to look ahead to better times and to discuss what's needed to support a faster and deeper economic recovery that lays a foundation for a more sustainable and inclusive global economic system. And there are plenty of ways you can take part in this special event. We're streaming in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic on World Bank Live and across our social channels. World Bank Live is also where our experts are taking your questions right now. And you can share your comments at any point using the hashtag inclusive future. Let's take a quick look at what we have lined up for you over the next hour. Quite a lineup, right? Our guests will be focusing on economic recovery through three broad lenses. First, sustainability. 
how can we make this recovery green and rebuild economic systems to better use resources and create a climate-friendly future? Second, resilience and innovation. How can farms reinvent themselves to create more jobs? And how can governments find new ways to transform the crisis into an opportunity for growth? Can we avoid a lost generation of youth? And our final area of discussion will be on the topic of inclusion. How can policymakers make sure everyone benefits from the recovery and inequality is not worsened? To kick things off, we have a stellar trio. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva, and leading the conversation, World Bank Group President David Malpas. They'll be talking about what it means to have a green, resilient, and inclusive recovery. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva uh, and with U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, to discuss the economic recovery and the kickoff of our spring meetings. The world faces major challenges, including COVID, climate change, rising poverty and inequality, and growing fragility and violence in many countries. The inequality is most apparent in the direct effects of COVID that hits uh, informal workers and the vulnerable the most. The inequality extends well beyond that to vaccinations, the concentration in wealth, the unequal impact of the fiscal stimulus and asset purchases, and the imbalance in debtor-creditor relationships, particularly for people in the poorest countries. The World Bank Group is leaning forward as much as possible to face these challenges. In response to COVID-19, we took broad, fast action and quickly achieved over 100 active operations of support for developing countries. Commitments rose 65% in 2020 from 2019. On vaccines, working closely with Gavi, WHO, and UNICEF, we've conducted over 100 capacity assessments, many even before vaccines were available. We are now passing several specific country vaccine financing operations each week through our board, with already 10 approved, 10 more scheduled in April, and around 30 more expected in May and June for a total of around $4 billion uh, in 50 countries. There are major challenges uh, for the countries in securing deliveries from COVAX and manufacturers, and we're working to support their efforts. Many developing countries entered the pandemic with unsustainable debt levels. We've worked to achieve a debt service suspension initiative and increase transparency in debt contracts. Both steps are helping. We've dramatically increased our grants and loans to the DSSI countries. Our goal is to maximize resources available to people. And we're working in close collaboration with the IMF uh, to support the G20's implementation of the Common Framework. We're pushing forward together on CHAD, uh, and the World Bank hopes to be able to put, put in substantial, fast dispersing resources. CHAD has a heavy burden of collateralized debt owed to a very narrow group of creditors presenting specific challenges. Uh, and finally, we're finalizing a new climate change action plan, which includes a big step up in financing, building on our record climate financing over the past two years. It includes new analytical support to countries as part of integrated climate and development programs. We want to achieve as much impact as possible with the increased financing. Our plan identifies key priorities for action with a focus on both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, it also includes a strong focus on a just transition from coal. And we're working toward aligning our financial flows with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. To conclude, I've noted big challenges. We're working to bring together uh, all together to achieve what we call GRID, green, resilient, and inclusive uh, development. We'll have separate events on debt tomorrow, 
climate transitions on Thursday and vaccines on Friday. Uh, and now uh, let me turn to Secretary Yellen, and I'm so pleased you're here. Thank you very much for that. Dr. Yellen, uh, it's been a year since, I, uh, since we were on a, 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 a presentation together. The world had a very hard year, uh, and, I'm, and the U United States under your leadership is uh, having a big impact. What, could you go through what's the U.S. doing to help the world recover economically from the crisis? Well, thanks so much, David. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, first of all, domestically, we're focusing on the pandemic and um, trying to promote vaccinations, testing, contact tracing to get it under control because we recognize that for the United States and for the world as a whole, the pandemic really is what's going to call the shots in terms of how the economy does. So that's first and foremost at home, and I think it's uh, equally important for the entire globe. Um, we are trying to support the most vulnerable people um, who typically are low-income people and minorities in the United States, and the same is true globally, I think, uh, those who work in the um, service sector and uh, minorities, uh, vulnerable people have been most impacted, both health-wise health and uh, in terms of the economic impact. So we have many programs that are supporting them, unemployment insurance programs, uh, relief um, for rental assistance, homelessness, um, uh, su support for families that um, are burdened with women who are out of the workforce because children can't go to school, trying to reopen um, schools as promptly as we can, and support state and local governments. Um, we've decided to go big um, because we think that the risks are of severe scarring if um, we we allow there to be long-term unemployment. And we're projecting a pretty rapid, as the, um, we deal with the pandemic, we're expecting a rapid recovery. I'm hopeful we'll be back to full employment next year. And once we are, we're going to turn to a longer-term agenda of investment, investment in infrastructure, in R&D, in people. But globally, I think that what we're doing domestically is helpful to the entire global community. Stronger growth in the U.S. is going to spill over positively uh, to the entire global outlook. And we are going to be careful to learn the lessons of the financial crisis, which is don't, su don't withdraw support too quickly. And we would encourage um, all those developed countries that have the capacity um, using fiscal policy uh, and monetary policy to continue to support a global recovery for the sake of the growth in the entire uh, global economy. Thanks. Fa fabulous. Managing Director Georgieva, um, you, you have been in the forefront of, uh, of worry about the inequality in the system, and I wonder if you could uh, give us some thoughts on that and what can the IMF do to ease the inequality? Uh, thank you very much for having me here at the bank. Fantastic to be with Secretary uh, Yellen and with you, uh, and if I may say, David. <laughs> I am uh, so uh, grateful that you are focusing on this question of inequality. What do we see today? The world economy is on a sounder footing. The recovery is progressing and actually actions taken by the United States to boost prospects for recovery in the US are helping the whole world. We are upgrading our projections for the year. But economic fortunes within countries and across countries are diverging dangerously. And this is why in these meetings, we are focusing on giving everyone a fair shot. A fair shot in the arm everywhere so we can bring the pandemic to a durable end 
to underpin sustainable recovery, but also a fair shot to a chance for a better life for vulnerable people and for vulnerable countries. And it is so important for the reasons both of you outlined that, that it is a focus because if we don't do it, then we risk inequalities to deepen and to hold societies and to hold growth back. What does it mean for us at the IMF? First and foremost, we have stepped up significantly the provision of financial lifelines to vulnerable countries, emerging markets with weak fundamentals, low income countries, uh, joining you, the World Bank, in making sure that those with limited fiscal space, no access to markets are not left out uh, from the recovery. Dr. Yellen, Madam Secretary, um, do, do, um, the, the, you interact with the advanced economies a lot. Uh, how do the, what can what can everyone do working together to achieve uh, a, 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 an inclusive recovery? I think um, it's the responsibility of the developed uh, countries to make sure that um, decades of progress in um, fighting poverty globally and trying to close income gaps between rich and poor countries, we need to see that that progress is not reversed because of the pandemic. We need to um, provide a package of resources that your organizations can use to um, help developing countries, low-income countries, um, I hope that we'll make progress on approving an SDR allocation, which I think would be a very important way to support um, the reserve needs globally, especially of low-income countries. Um, you mentioned tackling debt. I think that's uh, an extremely important initiative, concessional finance for the poorest countries. I want to turn a little bit, if we may, to uh, climate change. Um, these are these are immense issues for the whole world, uh, and so each each of us in our various ways are are interacting. I I went through our our uh, climate change action plan that we that we're just uh, uh, just releasing. But I wonder for the IMF, how do you think about the climate change issues in the context of the macroeconomic challenges that you uh, that you work on, and how can the IMF help on this area? Okay. Climate risks are a growing threat to macroeconomic and to financial stability. And with the same token, climate action offers the prospects for green growth and green jobs, critical for what we do at the IMF in supporting growth and employment. What we have embraced as a latecomer in this conversation is to zero in on our comparative strength. What is it that we are uniquely positioned to help the world accelerate the transition to the new climate economy? And it is macroeconomic data and research, fiscal and monetary uh, policies, crisis prevention, crisis response. So what we are doing at the IMF, working very closely with, with the World Bank and other organizations, are four areas of stepping up our work. So it is at the heart of what we do. First, policy advice. We engage with all countries in what is known as Article 4 consultations. And when we do so, we look at the criticality of mitigation and adaptation policies. Naturally, we do more on mitigation in countries that are high emitters, we do more on adaptation in countries that are more vulnerable. Secondly, we are zeroing in on climate-related financial stability risks. And we have a big role to play, standardized reporting of these risks, stress testing, and looking at the role of supervisory authorities. We have an instrument together with the World Bank, um, the uh, financial sector assessments, we are integrating uh, climate-related risks in these assessments. Third, data. 
uh, data tells a story to finance ministers like nothing else. Integrating carbon intensity and other climate data in quarterly macroeconomic data is what we are uh, pursuing, again, working with other organizations. So we are going to have uh, a dashboard that would help policymakers to see in one place their growth numbers, employment numbers, carbon intensity numbers. Last but not least, uh, uh, David, capacity development. Countries need to speed up their ability to integrate climate policies in their macroeconomic policies, and we are there for them. Janet, President Biden has, uh, has talked about the whole of economy approach, and you've noted that poor countries often are not the ones emitting the greenhouse gases. How does the world better invest in, in this problem and solving it? Obviously, climate change is a global problem, and we're not going to um, really be able to deal with greenhouse gas emissions successfully unless um, countries like the United States act domestically and then foster um, the transfer of resources and the financing that's necessary for developing countries uh, to be able to do so successfully. Um, President Biden is very focused on the U.S. climate agenda. Um, he's going to be proposing a package of infrastructure and climate change investments um, to make sure that we make our own uh, domestic contribution to meeting the Paris objectives. And we look to you and working with you um, in order to uh, make sure that the necessary resources for green, green development um, and finance are transferred to the developing countries that really need those resources. And I think both of your organizations have very important roles to play, um, maybe distinct roles to play, as Kristalina was mentioning. But, you know, we need to make sure that we help developing countries um, meet their climate goals along with their development um, objectives and um, the availability of green finance is critical to that. We're running toward the end of our conversation. Are there other topics that you want to raise? Uh, I'll turn to Kristalina. Well, the, uh, the importance of us uh, working together. We are in the uh, spring meetings. It brings the world to concentrate on what we can achieve faster and more efficiently by working uh, together. Uh, and I want to say two things. One, we are not giving enough credit to collaboration that has already taken place. In this crisis, central banks and finance authorities have stepped up swiftly in a coordinated manner we just calculated at the IMF that if that didn't happen on this scale and in that degree of coordination, the recession would have been three times deeper. In other words, we would have been lingering into a depression. And that value of bringing everybody together cannot be overstated. And my second point is to take at least one cheer for our scientists that have delivered vaccines in a record short time. We owe it to them to make sure that everybody gets an access to vaccine. There is no more important economic policy today than doing exactly uh, that. So let's use our coming together for building up the foundation of strong international cooperation for what you started from, David, green, smart, inclusive future for all of us. Yeah, that's, that's huge, both the cooperation side and the technology side. J Janet, closing. Um, I, I would simply say, I think resilience is important. And to me, one of the lessons of the crisis is that the global system um, 
you know, should have learned that we need to be better prepared for crises than we were for this one. Um, this may not be our very last health crisis ever, and I hope we will learn that we need to work together to um, be better prepared for future crises. Um, we have seen, um, certainly we in the United States have seen that our safety net um, wasn't all that it should be to protect the most vulnerable citizens. We have had to shore it up in a series of ad hoc actions. And I think making sure that our safety nets um, work here and throughout the world um, for future crises. Um, global supply chains, we, we saw weaknesses um, and problems in global supply chains. I think uh, thinking about, we had very efficient supply chains, but not very resilient supply chains. And that's an area that I think we should be trying to shore up. And finally, I'd say um, we did a lot after the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 to shore up the resilience of our core banking system. and. Um, we should appreciate that we did not have a banking crisis. Our banking systems um, were able to support um, growth and credit. But some areas outside the core banking system of non-bank financial intermediation showed tremendous stress. So I think we have more work to do to have a more resilient financial system. And in all these areas, again, globally, we need to work together to cooperate as in climate change to make progress. That's a great conclusion. So let's leave it there with resilience and the preparation for for uh, for being stronger on the recovery and in the next uh, in the next global expansion. Well, fingers crossed. Every uh, there's lots of work to be done, but that's a great conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, David. And there is more to that conversation. You can watch. The